Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. Welcome. Uh, my name is Danielle Sands. I'm a fellow at the Forum and I'm going to be chairing this evening's event in which we are going to be talking about multiculturalism and animal ethics. So we're going to think about questions such as what should we do when cultural or religious traditions appear to conflict with current ideas about animal ethics? And how does globalisation affect the scale and type of animal exploitation? So let me introduce our speakers. Uh, David Gromit is Senior Lecturer in Theology and Ethics at the University of Edinburgh. Angie Pepper is Lecturer in Philosophy at the University of Birmingham. And Varun Uburoi is Reader in Political Theory and Public Policy at Brunel University. So I think in order to talk about this, in order to think about the relationship between multicultural and multiculturalism and animal ethics, we need to kind of settle on an idea of what animal ethics is. Mm. Varun, perhaps you can start things off. Okay, um, so I think the first thing to say is that hopefully this is a, a conversation across specialisms. I've written at length about multiculturalism. I've never written about animal ethics. The reverse is sort of true, at least to some extent, with my colleagues here. So I'm hoping that they will correct me if I'm saying anything that's off-beam or mistaken in some way. So when I think about the term animal ethics, I, Aristotle springs to mind. His ethics is about how people should live well, and he works with an idea of human beings. He has a hierarchy. And then when we begin to talk about animal ethics, we're altering this hierarchy. We're noticing that there are certain relationships between human beings and animals. These relationships are categorical in the sense that we might categorize human beings as animals and talk about human animals and non-human animals. These relationships are also empirical in some sense, in that we can have an effect on animals. Given that we can have an effect on animals, we begin to think about how we should treat them. And then this then leads to perhaps how I think about animal ethics, which is really the sort of question that looks something like this. How can and should we live with and among animals? Now, I think this idea of animal ethics moves very quickly into the idea of animal rights. And the reason why it moves very quickly into animal rights is when we notice that we can be categorized as animals, when we notice that we have relationships with animals, when we notice that we can have an impact on animals, we might then begin to ask, well... Are they so different? Human beings have a right to life. Do animals? Human beings want to lead lives free of pain. Don't animals? Animals seem to be, in some sense, very similar to human beings. And so, like human beings, we can often think of animal rights. But it's at this point that I sometimes pause. Because I think, well, look, a right is something that I can put forward and say, look, I have this if someone challenges me. I have a right to X. Animals can't do that. Likewise, animals have rights. Likewise, we might say that rights come with something like responsibilities. Let me think of an example. I have a right to play music. I have a responsibility to turn that music off at about 11 p.m. so that my neighbours can get some sleep. A dog has a right to bark. It seems very strange to say a dog has a responsibility to stop, to stop barking at 11 p.m. so that people can sleep. These rights seem to apply to animals, but also not. And yet, I think there is a way in which we can think about animal rights. I think we can think that animals have interests, interests that should be protected, such as a right to life. 
a right to live life with minimal degrees of pain if we can ensure that. And in that sense, I do think that we can plausibly talk about animal ethics and plausibly talk about animal rights. And I think that, as best as I can, addresses the, the first question. David, I wonder whether you uh, want to respond to that. Is, is rights the best way to think about animal ethics? Well, well maybe not, and I, I very much, much hear the reservations there. Perhaps we could stay with Aristotle for a bit longer to think about as a complementary approaches. I mean, as you know, he grew up in, in, in a rural part of Greece and spent a lot of his early life around animals, particularly farmed animals, Later on in his life, once he got in with Alexander, uh, it seems that having this great patron, he was able to have lots of exotic species brought to him for further research and categorization. And, and although these aren't the best known of Aristotle's works, if one actually looks at them, something like 20% of his works are directly about animals. So this is a really important and a neglected area of his work. I've, in fact, recently published an article on, if anyone is interested more. Uh, so, so it seems to me a, a key thing with, with Aristotle on, on animals, and, and, and some veterinary ethicists have picked up on this, is the idea of purpose, teleology, that it's not just humans who have a purpose, uh, but animals do too, and even actually inanimate objects in, in some sense. It's not even limited to sentient beings. So if... If an entity has a purpose, there's some, there's some sense in, it, in, that, in saying that it's morally, morally appropriate, that it should be able to fulfill that, that purpose, uh, that telos, within the sort of network of purposes that make up the world. Uh, one interesting thing Aristotle says about animals is that uh, farmed animals are actually... In, su in some sense better off than wild animals because they are, they are ordered according to rational, i.e. human principles. Uh, so that sort of pulls us away from, maybe from a sort of liberationist view of animals. So, I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a farmed animal, right? <laughs> um, Why not? I because you have your I, food provided, your drink provided, shelter. So one of the things that was that Varon said was about this kind of animals having an, having all of these really important interests, including an interest um, in continuing to live. But it seems to me that they have also have really important agency interests, right? Mm. They've got preferences and desires, and if they could, they would live life in accordance with those preferences and desires, making choices for themselves. And when we exert the kinds of control over their lives, over their lives that we currently do, they're not unable, right, to exercise any kind of agency in those situations. So we have complete control over who they interact with, what they eat, when they eat, what activities they have, you know, are able to do in a day. All of that stuff is a real constraint on some of their central interests. So it's not obvious to me that just because they're not vulnerable. Um, to predators or vulnerable to illness, as wild animals are, that they're better off, right, in virtue of their captivity and the way that we treat them. If, if we treat them well, uh, maybe they could be. Uh, clearly there are different farming systems for, for the same species, and high wel welfare would normally be associated uh, with allowing the animal the ability to exhibit normal behaviour. So this includes the ability to make decisions and choices and play a according to the ways that are, that are uh, characteristic of that species. Yeah, I, I completely agree that some farming systems fail abysmally in this, but I'm not sure that all of them do. All farming systems assume that the animal is there to be used by us, right? That they're property or an object... Um, they're, they're, they're there precisely because they're a resource that we're going to manipulate. And I just don't see how that's compatible with non-human animal interests in being self-determining creatures. Now, like, this might mean that for some domesticated animals, we just don't have them anymore, right? Mm. We just wind down the numbers of those animals because we bring them into existence, we bring them into these 
the um, conditions of captivity, which are, are, they're unable to flourish in, right, as the kinds of creatures that they are, or their capacity to flourish has been uh, undermined by all of the breeding that we've done, right? So for me, it's just not at all obvious that farming practices are going to be compatible um, so you're suggesting something quite dramatic there, Angie, that, that we need to prioritise animal welfare in such a way that might mean that some species, or so we don't have domestic animals anymore. I mean, I guess I want to bring this, tie this towards the, the topic of, of the discussion, which is the, the relationship between multiculturalism and animal ethics. So what do we do when there are certain cultural practices that seem to conflict with these ideas we have about animal welfare or animal ethics more broadly? So I guess one thing I want to say is that I'm worried already about the way that the debate is being framed, yep. right? So it's true that there are minority group practices, right, that harm animals. So we can talk about fox hunting or we can talk about religious slaughter. But the big problem is with our mainstream cultural practices, right? That's where a lot of our energies mm. should be focused. Um, and so I worry a little bit when we talk about multiculturalism and animals and whether multiculturalism is good or bad for animals, that in a way it just serves to detract or obfuscate the harms that are done to animals by mainstream uh, practices. So, yeah. Well, I tend to agree um, with what Angie's saying. And I guess my point of reference here is a, a now famous article in which a particular philosopher, Casale, asks whether or not multiculturalism is bad for animals. And the way of formulating the question is itself a little curious. First, it assumes that cultural minorities are the only focus of multiculturalism, which is very odd. People like me have been writing for a long time about how anti-discrimination is part of multiculturalism. The main perpetrators of discrimination are majorities. This, is, this idea that multiculturalism is only about minorities is a little odd. Second, it detracts, as Andrew rightly said, from cultural majorities and the ways in which they treat animals. And thirdly, it fails to appreciate the ethical systems that exist among cultural minorities that can be far more amenable to animals, think about aspects of Hinduism or Taoism, than various cultural majority practices. So the way in which this question is raised is a little odd. But what can we say? Well, I think we can reasonably ask <coughs> if a religious group has certain practices that seem to infringe the rights of animals, for example, during a ritual, this was Casale's example. Is this acceptable? Can this minority group defend the practice? If they cannot, what should we do about it? Or we might ask, look, there are some ways of slaughtering meat for consumption that seem to brutalize animals. They suffer pain in ways that they shouldn't necessarily. Can these practices be changed? Can these groups defend their practices? We might ask those sorts of legitimate questions. But if you want to really address the issues of animal rights, you are talking about a very small aspect of that debate when you're focusing on minorities. And so I think Angie's absolutely right to question the way in which this is being framed. We can make quite interesting headway with regards to multiculturalism and animals. But if you're really interested in animal rights, I'm not sure I would start with minorities. This is an interesting point in terms of what practices are, are actually characteristic of, of particular religious groups, both when they're in a, in a minority context and a majority context. So in, in Britain, there is an association in many people's minds between uh, Islam halal practice and non-stun slaughter. Uh, however, in the Middle East, because of, of, of the climate and lack of grass, it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to raise cattle there. So a huge amount of, of meat, and actually particularly sheep, is 
imported from New Zealand. And in New Zealand, uh, slaughter, uh, stunning before slaughter is obligatory. Uh, so in, in many majority Muslim countries, this is accepted. However, it's more controversial, it seems, in countries where Muslims are in, in a minority. Why is this? Well, maybe part of it is that there's a tendency to try to keep hold of traditional practices uh, for longer uh, because they are a le legitimately an important marker of one's identity as, as a group. Uh, so, so this is one reason, actually, I want to have quite a rigorous dialogue with people supporting non-stun slaughter because certainly in the case of, of, of Muslims, it's, it's not the case that this is regarded as, as the norm or even that it's majority practice in many majority Muslim countries? I mean, I, th I think it's a, it's a very good empirical observation that you've made. Um, and I like the way that you say that you want to have a, a rigorous conversation with Muslims. And I think that really goes to the heart of, I think, how these sorts of issues should be dealt with. You see, one option is to ban a practice. Just say, we don't do this here. But I think such a, a ban would lack legitimacy because Muslims are citizens too. It should at least be some sort of conversation, discussion with them, a dialogue in which Muslims are given an opportunity to see if they can defend the practice. And if they can't, to see whether or not there's any way in which they can amend the practice, to work out compromises. And I think this presupposes that a group, I don't want to focus too much on Muslims, I think there's too much of that, but this presupposes we have an environment in which a particular minority group is self-confident and at ease with their place in a society such that they're open to changes. Groups of people who don't feel self-confident about their place will often be defensive and closed to ideas of changes. So I think the question with regards to how we deal with minority groups who have practices that some might want to question is to say to them, well, okay, first, how can we create the type of society in which minorities feel self-confident and comfortable enough to be open to changes. And I think that would be the deeper problem, in a sense, because I think that presupposes a range of policy measures and it probably presupposes a level of cultural change amongst the majority so that they welcome minorities, help them to feel at ease, and so that the difficult conversations can then be had. So, I feel like I'm just going to... So, I guess that one thing that I find um, uneasy about all of this, right? Mm. So, there's an assumption that we can have a dialogue um, with minority groups about practices that the majority finds um, cruel or barbaric or what, however they want to cash it out, as though the majority has already figured it all out, right? That they've already got a set of policies um, and laws which are internally consistent and they treat animals in, in all the same ways. And that's just false, right? So we live in a society which treats animals very differently depending on their purpose. So if you're a livestock animal, you're less well protected than if you are a companion animal. If you're a research animal, you're less well protected. So whilst it would be... Um, whilst it would be terrible and illegal and punishable if I poison my dog, right, it's fine for a scientist to do the same. So depending on the animal, the particular individual animal and their purpose, we treat them very differently. And things that we think are cruel in one domain are not in other domains. And so it seems to me that we just don't even have the basis to start judging or questioning or holding to account 
minority cultural practices that do things that we take to be cruel or barbaric when we've got all of this other stuff going on in the majority culture. So it's hard, I think, to find a ground <coughs> to like, have that kind of conversation when we're not starting off from a perspective which really takes seriously the interests and status, moral status of non-human animals. And how would we establish that? How would we begin? <laughs> how are we going to change the world? Uh, one mind at a time. Um, I mean, really, it's a cultural conversation that we need to have at society-wide level, right? And people's minds need to be changed um, in terms of how we think about animals and drawing attention to the ways that we treat them inconsistently and think about them inconsistently. And politically and legally, that change is only going to come as more and more people put pressure on those in power to make those kinds of changes. So really, it's a social justice movement, right? It's a social justice movement for non-human animals, and that's where we're going to get to the place that we need to be, I think, before we can start you know, accusing minority groups of doing something that we find to be. Well, it's, it's a cultural conversation, but it's also a matter of of applying scientific understanding as, as it currently is. Uh, so most scientists and welfare specialists would say there's clear evidence that stunning an animal before it's killed is a less painful method of killing than, uh, than not doing that and, and using the uh, method of, sort of cutting the neck and, and exsanguination. Uh, so there's a there's a belief among some advocates of exsanguination that this somehow has a stunning effect. Uh, but the, the, the scientific research really does seem to say that when stunning works well, it is con which it normally does, it's, it's considerably better. That's not to say there aren't some issues with mainstream practice, such as using electric water baths for broiler hen stunning or using carbon dioxide for, for pig stunning, uh, but, but those, are, those are being worked on and quite appropriately challenged within the welfare discussion at the moment. So I, I think so secular practice is under, is, is under scrutiny and being improved, uh, but, but these, these things perhaps don't get so much publicity. So I think I just have a hard time um, getting on board or being in any way kind of excited or optimistic about these kind of incremental changes. And the fixation on the point of death seems to me to be not where the action is, right? It's the whole life of the animal. And so I know that, you know, you're interested in animal welfare, particularly on farms, but I want to question why they're there in the first place, right, and why we think about them as, as property, as objects, as resources, as things to be consumed, and why we don't think about them as being agents in their own right, right? ends in themselves. Right? In the but would you then say, Andy, that, that this kind of work is counterproductive? That if we're doing this kind of incremental work, then actually what it means is it makes us feel better about the existence in the farm of, of farms in the first place. Yeah, so there is a sense, I think, in which it just legitimates the practice, right? So we can say, oh, but they had a nice death, right? So everything else looks like it's humane, but it's not, right? There's all of these other questions. It's not that I'm saying, right, that some deaths are not worse than others. It's just that it's hard to kind of rally behind this as as a, a point of, for positive change or... So would, would, would you really be advocating the, the end to all animal farming and, and, and consumption of animals and their products by humans? Yes. <laughs> That's not going to happen, is it? So... so... <laughs> Those, those, those of us who think that's not that's well, even if we wanted it in principle, even if we whether it's going to happen in practice, isn't trying to improve things as they are better because it will make more of a practical impact. So I don't want to say that <coughs> animal welfare doesn't matter given the currently extremely non-ideal uh, conditions in which we're operating. Right, so. There are definitely worse ways to treat animals um, who are 
captive uh, in farms and zoos and research laboratories and all that kind of stuff. Um, but to my mind, that's not where the kind of the force of our obligations lie, right? It's not that we should be trying to make their lives better in those situations. We should be trying to end all of those practices. And you're right, it's not going to happen anytime soon, but change doesn't happen that quickly in general, right? And we're making moves, (laughs) and we've got to be optimistic that we keep, you know, if we keep the pressure on, the number of animals that are being slaughtered for human consumption, raised and kept and slaughtered for human consumption, is going to be diminished, right? The less people eat animals, the less the demand's going to be there. So I advise you to stop eating animals. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, you're right, it's not going to change, and we should care about the welfare legislation in place, and we would hope to make that more and more robust. But ultimately, that's not really where the action is, right? We want to be fighting to liberate the animals is the... <laughs> well I, I tend to agree with what Angie's just said in the sense that I wouldn't narrow my horizons by what I think is achievable um, but I also want to just come back to something that Angie said before because it seemed almost as if we were in a sense that she was saying something contrary to what I had said before whereby she was suggesting, look, what's in, how can a cultural majority speak to minorities when their own practices, the cultural majority's practices, are so internally inconsistent and difficult to defend? And I think that point is well taken, but I also don't think it's inconsistent with what I said, which is the suggestion that we must go back to the cultural majority. The deeper problem, even if, you, even if you want to focus on cultural minorities and getting them to change certain practices, the deeper problem begins with the cultural majority. The type of moral status that they have when their practices are so internally inconsistent, but also the type of practices that they have towards minorities that make them closed <coughs> to changes and suggestions of change. I actually think what we're saying is entirely consistent, that the focus, when we're talking about multiculturalism and animal ethics, shouldn't necessarily be on minorities. It must first and foremost be on a cultural majority. So in what ways can uh, an increased dialogue between the majority and the minorities kind of help, help with these kind of questions that we're asking? Well... When we look at the ways in which these sorts of situations can be addressed, cultural majorities have options. They could say, look, in our society, the harm principle is very important, and we're extending that to animals. You must not harm animals. To which the minority can then say, well, if the harm principle is very important, what about practice A, practice B, practice C? However, if a cultural majority modestly says, we accept that our practices are internally inconsistent, problematic, need to be radically reformed, but that doesn't change the fact that that's true of at least some of your practices as well. Now let's try and work together to try and reform our own and your practices. Then I think actually we've got the basis of an equitable dialogue that entails change on all sides. Now, at this point, I can feel almost the same response that you gave before, Dave, because I think it would apply to what I'm saying. That's not going to happen. It doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. And it doesn't mean that this shouldn't ultimately be the goal. Something, it seems to me, conversation can usefully do is try to draw out uh, uh, from uh, uh, adherents of particular religions a deeper and wider understanding of their own tradition and discipline. It was rightly said earlier that, uh, with regard to animals, this is about far more than just the killing method. So if one looks at authoritative historic teaching in both Islam and Judaism, uh, there are many things that present secular welfare people would would strongly advocate. So, for instance, uh, 
castration, uh, castration and other mutilations are often regarded as problematic, yet these are standard practice in the farming industry. Uh, mm. So a uh, ban on mutilations also means you can't, say, sort of cut off an animal's tail while it's still alive, something like that, e either because you think it's for disease prevention, which it might be, say, preventing fly strike in sheep, or because you want to eat it as a, as a delicacy, something like oxtail, so you can't do that. Uh, if an animal's uh, injured or harmed, it, it, it can't be presented, according to some rel religious authorities. So this... Is a, is a strong discourager of, of abuse of animals in any way, and actually it's, it's, it's encouraging uh, farmers and stock persons to look after the animal well during its lifetime. Uh, but even, even within uh, members of these religions, let alone outside of them, there's often very little understanding of this wider animal ethics beyond slaughter. So I guess one thing that I'm kind of interested in, so thinking about the dialogue between majority and minority cultures, is whether we should think of ethical vegans, right? So people who don't eat um, animals or animal products uh, because they think it violates the rights of non-human animals. So whether those people constitute a minority cultural group, right? So one thing that you might be doing as an ethical vegan, right, is putting pressure on majority cultural practices. And the more of you that there are, right, you occupy this space as a group together, right, committed to organizing your system of beliefs around the same principle. Now, it's the same set of principles. Now, we might, I don't know whether we want to call that a cultural group. I'm not sure. Um, it definitely seems that there are social networks in place, um, supporting people's individual uh, identities and the system of beliefs that they hold. So in that sense, it's not obvious that kind of, you just get, they're going to get excluded as a cultural group. Um, but I kind of wonder about that interaction right, between the dominant culture, the majority culture, and ethical vegans as a minority cultural group right, who are standing up. For and uh, by being labelled as such, they'd be afforded some kind of protection? Yeah, so you should think that, you know, Having that um, system of beliefs, which is central to your identity, is a protected identity, right? So if you happen to find yourself in a hospital or in a care home um, or in a prison, hopefully not, um, <laughs> then you should have access to a vegan diet. If you work for, I don't know, the military or police force, or to be honest, anybody, right, you shouldn't be forced to wear a uniform which is made of animal products, so no leather boots and helmets or whatever it might be. Um, so all of those kinds of things then the state ought to be protecting right, this minority group um, and their identity and, and the system of belief that they're committed to. So there shouldn't be any discrimination in your employment or harassment because of your views. All of those things should be protected. And so I think kind of when we think about multiculturalism and animals, it might be sort of important to start thinking about ethical vegans as a cultural group right? and thinking about that as a protected identity. And then thinking about the interaction between that group and the majority culture in order to get the kind of change that we want. Yeah. Well, well I, I'm, I'm very respectful indeed of vegans and, and, and vegetarians of different stripes. Uh, but I suppose it seems to me a little bit odd to think of vegans as, as a minority cultural group. F firstly, because there are, there are many other dietary identities, and I'm wondering why veganism deserves special protection. Also, and, I, and more fundamentally, I guess to me, the notion of a culture is, some, is something that is, is historically rooted, uh, it has persisted through time, and it's defined by a range of characteristics rather than a single characteristic. Might I just sort of try to interject? I think there's a halfway position between you both whereby we often think about a culture as something that we're born into. And so if people are born into a, a majority culture or a minority culture, we're talking about a, a set of traditions, norms, values, 
helps to regulate their lives, that helps to attribute ideas of what's worth pursuing and what's not to their lives. And in some sense, at least for the purpose of some public policy measures that I think are important, I think we have to preserve the idea of cultures as being something that we're born into. So a great many exemptions for certain minority practices, think about turban-wearing Sikhs, being able to ride a motorcycle or work on a building site. They're one with the, a lot of those sorts of exemptions are one by saying, well, you don't really have a choice to be about what cultural group you're born into. So if someone says, well, look, you could just remove your turban. Or if someone says, let's think about, for example, a child who a hijab-wearing child or a turban-wearing boy who is going to school and the school mandates a school uniform with no headdress. Now, the school can say, well, look, you have a choice to take off your hijab. You have a choice to take off your turban and come to the school. Now, this, to my mind, is slightly problematic because the turban-wearing boy, the hijab-wearing girl has to forego something that's very important to them so as to attend the school. Choice shouldn't necessarily be something that constitutes a cultural group, at least for certain public policy measures that I think are defensible. But that doesn't mean we can't have other group rights. And vegans can be a group, but they don't necessarily need to be a cultural group. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have certain norms, certain traditions, certain ways of thinking, but they're ethical vegans. That's the important point, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And they've chosen that. Now, we get hard cases if, for example, you're born into an ethical vegan family. What does, the ch does the child have a choice to just leave? But it surely can't... So, this is your area, so... I'm <laughs> yeah. But it seems to me implausible that... What, that the reason that you're entitled to certain protections is because you're born into a cultural group. People choose and change their identities all the time. They move from one religion, one faith to another. Um, they can change gender, right? People can do all of these. And it doesn't, it seems quite, it seems implausible to, to me to think that those people just kind of get the protections in virtue of the fact that there's a group that already exists and some people were born into it, right? Well, I think that people who change religions, people who easily walk away from their faith, are perhaps the exceptions and not the rules. I mean, I, I, want, I worry about fetishizing autonomy and choice and saying, look, we all do this. It's very true if you're an academic, you make lots of choices, and it's very true if lots of your friends are academics or of a particular socioeconomic class. Choice is very important. But for a great many people, like a hijab-wearing girl, taking off her hijab just to attend a school because she has the choice to do so, well, they might say, well, look, it's a formal possibility that I can do that. It's not really a choice. I, wouldn't, I couldn't possibly countenance the thought. Such a, this idea of making choice central, I, I would worry about it, and I would worry about its implications for, for example, the hijab-wearing girl who wants to attend a school. But I take it that part of what we're getting at when we're suggesting that there are certain identities or systems of belief that are deserving of protection is this idea that they're central to a person's conception of the good, right? So what they value in life, the way they want to live their life, how they're going to interact with others, the sorts of activities that they're going to engage in, what they choose to eat, right? <laughs> all of that stuff. It's all part and parcel of the, of the thing that makes them them. And so it's unclear to me why it matters what the genesis of that is, right? So why it matters that you're born into something or you find it. And I think that this is especially going to be true for a lot of vegans because, as you rightly point out, we don't live in a society where ethical veganism is the majority culture. In fact, for a lot of people, you discover it much later <coughs> in life. You're not born into it. 
I think that choice is important in this situation because it's not an abstract situation, it's contextual. And a lot of these legal exemptions were won purely on the basis that, for a lot of people, they have a formal possibility of removing, for example, their headdress, but it's not really a choice. It's not really something that they could choose to do. A possibility for them, perhaps. But they would have to forego something so deep that they couldn't possibly countenance it. So is your suggestion that for ethical ve vegans, they choose not to eat animals or animal products, but it's a choice that they could just overcome because it's not that important to them in some well, they might, foundational sense? They might, they might choose it for a great many reasons, some of which will be very deep and profound, some of which... I mean, I d I d some of which might not be very deep and profound. People make choices for all kinds of reasons. I can't assume that all people are making all choices for the deepest possible reasons. That would be a very big assumption indeed. But I guess that the starting point was that ethical vegans are committed to the rights of other animals, right? Mm -hmm. That it is morally impermissible to harm other animals, mm. to treat them in certain ways, to kill them and eat them. We have no need for that, and they have a right that we don't do it. And so it's not a choice, right? It's a moral imperative. Like, and so the claim that you could just choose you know, to wake up in the morning and eat pigs and cows it just seems disingenuous. It just doesn't take seriously um, the force with which many ethical vegans feel their moral convictions. How about the poor rodents under the combine harvester? I, I think it's a mistake to think that we can ever be in a position where we're not implicated in the killing of animals in any way. Uh, and if one thinks of it at sort of microbial level, uh, the, 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 the necessity of killing uh, very small animals, insects, to stop them eating crops... Uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is your presentation of veganism, but I think we need to be very careful of thinking that there's any sort of moral place we can put ourselves where we're not implicated in killing in any way. I don't believe I could do that if I wanted to. <coughs> so, sadly, living in a world full of sentient beings is a moral tragedy, right? Um, I think it's quite good. <laughs> Depends on where you sit on the hierarchy, I guess. Um, so, I mean, one thing to get clear is that, and there are there are going to be disagreements, um, philosophical disagreements amongst vegans about you know where you draw the line, right? Which animals you think have got rights, and why do you think that they've got rights? But pretty much all of us agree that sentience is the key thing, right? If an animal mm. has the capacity to think and feel, right, in this world. Um, they have these preferences and desires and all of this stuff that makes them morally considerable, then we don't have any right to be using them in the ways that we do. So let's just say that that's the kind of foundational, uh, the cornerstone of ethical veganism. So there are going to be these complicated questions about insects. And I think most ethical vegans would say, well, don't deliberately kill insects, right? Don't get out of your way to go and kill insects. And try to avoid it where you can, right? Now, it can't be the case given the way the world is and that sentient animals are everywhere, that we're going to avoid killing all of them, right? It's just impossible. But we face, like, very basic choices in our day-to-day -day lives about how we act, the goods we, that we consume. And they're simple, right? You just don't eat animals. You don't need to, right? Now, it's true. Combine harvesters might kill field mouse and do, right? And birds and all kinds of things. <coughs> um, we have to eat. And we try to devise ways, right, where those, ki those deaths don't happen. So, it's, you know, maybe that's just fantastical and science fiction, but it's not implausible. But when we've got these really stark, basic, obvious choices about what we do in our day-to-day -day lives, where it's just necessary, right, that you're going to end up, that an animal has been killed in order to benefit you in some way, you can just choose not to, right? And you ought to choose not to. That animal had a right not to be killed and used in those ways. I'm interested in what you all think about how legislation feeds into this. Is it that we need to change everyone's minds and then the law follows, or is it the other way around? Well, <coughs> legislation does have a very important part in the UK in, having, in us having some of the highest 
welfare standards in farming in the world, and this has been linked with our participation in the European Union. A lot of animal welfare legislation is, is common across Europe, and as we well know with all the Brexit discussions, it's, it's extremely important for free trade. Uh, I think the thing about legislation is that at its best it is informed by, by sci scientific understanding. And animal welfare legislation and the sort of regulations stemming from this get, get, get very detailed and they're based on, on actually our, our current understanding of some of the ways that animals fl flourish and the, the kind of things they need. I would say though, I, I think increasingly it's it's consumer preference and the way that is provided for uh, by food business operators and supermarkets is really important. So each one of us, when we go into a supermarket, we or, or, or a local local farm shop or market, uh, we we have choices to make based on the information available to us about the welfare levels of 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 the particular animal product we're buying. So it's legislation, but also cons consumer preference, uh, uh, particularly in a supermarket context, because supermarkets have increasingly sophisticated ways of delivering particular welfare standards. Some of you will be aware of, of the RSPCA Assured Scheme, so that is just one example of an sort of independent benchmark that uh, some uh, foods and some supermarkets will have, and you can then go online if you want, look up the standards for that particular uh, species, and then get quite a good understanding of how those animals have been kept. Uh, so yes, I would say legislation and the role of, of retailers and consumers together. I guess I would worry about how legitimate any and I do believe there's, been, there's a need for radical change, but I would worry about how legitimate any radical legislation that just, for example, pursued a, a, an ethical vegan agenda, I wonder how legitimate it would be if a majority of people were not convinced by it and a majority of people opposed it. But it wouldn't get and passed, would it? That's, but, we, 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 but, we're, but we're first just talking about how, whether or not it's legitimate. Then the next question I was going to say, well, you, actually, you can think about lots of things. Think about the poll tax introduced. Didn't, didn't go very far, but that was going to be my second point, which is that I worry about the efficacy of such legislation. Imagine we had a, a sensible prime minister with a, a <laughs> radical <laughs> vegan agenda... I think the first one was more hard to conceptualise than the second in some ways. <laughs> um, imagine we had such a sensible Prime Minister, they introduced such legislation. I wonder how effective it would be, even if it is morally right, and I wonder how legitimate it would be, and I wonder whether or not that legitimacy somehow undermines the moral rightness of such legislation. So I'm for cultural change first, and legislation reflecting <coughs> that. So, I mean, it's quite, it just raises a bunch of interesting questions about historic injustice to oppressed groups, like women, for example. <laughs> you know, do we have to wait for everybody to agree, right, that we need some laws in place <coughs> to secure women's status as equal citizens? Would it be illegitimate? Right to impose that legislation on people who didn't agree. And so I guess there's just a tension right, between the call for legitimacy and the call for justice. And balancing that right. is difficult. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be erring on the side of justice over legitimacy, but I guess one question is, what would it take for it to be legitimate in your eyes? This is a sort of chicken and egg situation, right? What comes first? Legislation, for sure, would precipitate some change. But presumably you need some change in order to convince, for example, politicians to vote for it. 
I don't have a very good answer to your question, but when I think about the parallel of, for example, race relations legislation, I do think that such legislation would have been incomprehensible in the 1930s, was more comprehensible because of the human rights revolution that begins broadly in the post-war period, and such legislation is an extension of those ideas. It's almost, I mean, we're here at the LSC and uh, an important and very famous 20th century LSE thinker was Michael Oakeshott. And he talked about pursuing the intimations of traditions of thought. Well, race relations legislation, one way of thinking about it was that it was pursuing the intimations of a tradition of equality and rights that had emerged, gathered force, and had convinced just enough to say, actually, this is right. I think that's probably what's needed before you can introduce the type of legislation that would be legitimate for an ethical vegan agenda. And if that happens, it'll probably come through uh, e ecological issues. Uh, that's my sense. Uh, uh, that... Uh, but we know how uh, how costly it is to, in in terms of energy conversion, to eat uh, animals rather than to eat vegetable protein directly. And, for instance, cows are producing a lot of methane, uh, which uh, is causing uh, <coughs> problems in the upper atmosphere. Uh, at the same time, let's remember that the largest global producer of methane is wetlands, which we can't do much about. I wonder whether now might be a good time to take some questions from the audience. So I'll take a couple at once and then um, the one in the middle. Um, I am from Japan. Uh, my In my home country, a minor group of people are, um, a cat sell and eat a whales, and um, a, most of the countries criticize us, and we're just saying, "What? Oh, that's none of none of your business." And a, my question is, how we can bridge this? Um, a the um, long debate, a in a more constructive way. It's, it's been a um, black and white uh, discussion, but we like to move things forward. So what, what do you think? Thank you. I think there was another question around there, if you could. Oh, there's a question. we we'll take all three. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, well, firstly, thank you for a very interesting debate so far. I was just curious. Um, this is very focused, uh, very heavily focused on farm animals predominantly. Um, I wondered how your views of multiculturalism, um, how your views differ, apply to a context of working animals, for example, um, of which there are millions in the world, affecting not only just different cultures, but particularly different classes that might not be able to defend their own human rights if we don't, to some extent, explore the animal rights. So I wondered um, how your views apply to, to that context. Thank you. Uh, there's a question at the back there. If you could pass the mic back. In a week or so, there will be a big protest by Animal Rebellion. And their demand is that the government reduces greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2025. Now, Animal Rebellion is for animal rights, and they just recognize the fact that 14.5% of greenhouse gas emissions globally come from animal farming. What do you think about animal rebellion? Have you heard of them? Thank you. Okay, so just to remind you, there's a question about whaling, question about working animals, and a question about animal rebellion. I take it we won't all answer each of these, otherwise we'll be talking for take a long time pick. on the stage. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Well, 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 shall I reflect on the whales then? Uh, 
not something I know much about uh, because we don't whale in the UK, as you well know, uh, but it, it do does happen in some parts of Europe. Uh, the approach I'd be wanting to take is, is to try to uh, understand the, the uh, pain and suffering that the whales are likely to experience uh, based on scientific understanding of their, of their physiology and, and the killing method and the time it takes. Uh, and then when I had that understanding, I wanted to ask, well, do we need more research doing into this? If so, how can we do it ethically? If, 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 we've, if we've got a decent amount of scientific information about it and we think there's a real welfare issue here, then it seems to me that dialogue does have, is needed. Um, w one thing that concerns me is when religious groups or cultural traditions or, or, or regional practices are viewed as somehow being, being beyond reason, beyond debate. Uh, I very much want to respect uh, culture and tradition. As a, as a Christian myself, those are very important to me. But I don't like the idea that there are somehow these, these sort of little islands of activity that, that, that can't be changed or dialogued with. Um, working animals. So I wasn't entirely sure which kind of animals you had in mind. So you might think that um, tourism... Uh, people who work with elephants, for example, or a case, not that kind of case. No. I was more referring to working oxen and working donkeys in Africa. Okay. Yeah. Not just you here in the 19th century. This is why the RSPCA was, was set up to, to a large extent. And so is the worry that um, for a lot of impoverished people in the world, their livelihood... Um, depends t t on the exploitation uh, of other animals. And then in, in so many cases, it's not... Uh, that's not to say that they're, like, you know, mistreating their animals. Um, it's rather that their livelihood depends on it. And so if you have a position like mine, what does that mean for those people, right? Um, and I guess the, the short answer is we would... Given the animals... All animals globally, I think, have the same rights. Then they're all entitled uh, to live lives um, that are free um, and as happy as they can be and not be oppressed by humans. Now, it's difficult because we live in a world in which humans are oppressing other humans. And so we've got this global injustice that already exists in the background. And so the only way, right, you're going to be able to stop... Um, animals being exploited and oppressed is by stopping humans from being exploited and oppressed, right? So humans need to be able to support themselves and live flourishing lives without exploiting other animals, and they're going to need support from other humans, right? So in a way, it's just it's a question of global injustice and global distribution and redistribution of resources. We should be able to feed ourselves as a global community without relying on the exploitation and oppression of other animals. So, back to David's point, that's not going to happen anytime soon, but that's, I guess, where my, what my position ultimately is on that. So, there's no easy answer, but I think that's... Well, I think I'm only going to address the question about whale, whaling in Japan, and, and I'm only going to do so very, very indirectly. Um, and I guess my answer starts a little closer to home because I think people are convinced by idioms that they're familiar with and as I talked about at the beginning I'm, I'm not sure about this whether or not this idea of animal rights I think it's very cogent but I'm not sure it's always going to convince people and if people are convinced with idioms that they're familiar with the next question becomes well are there any internal resources within Japan, the way in which people think about the relationships between human beings, human animals and non-human animals, that can be displayed? And I guess I'll, I'll talk about this more in relation to perhaps my own Hindu upbringing. Um, it, it's, 
it always struck me as a little peculiar when, I guess when I first started learning about philosophy at university, you, you read sort of Kant's idea of human dignity. And I thought, well, you know, I wasn't brought up to think about human dignity in this way as hierarchical with animals. I was taught that we have duties to all creatures. Think about the Indian concept of ahisma. We're not meant to harm any living creature. Or think about reincarnation. We we are reborn in multiple different bodies. Some of these bodies can be some of these bodies can be animals, and that means the human that means the self isn't necessarily human. These internal resources were very very convincing to me. Far more convincing than the first time I picked up Robert Nozick's Anarchy State and Utopia and he talked about us being utilitarians where animals are concerned and Kantians where people are concerned. I saw things in different ways. I was convinced by things I was familiar with. And I wonder about, not knowing anything about Japanese political and moral thought, I wonder whether there are internal resources that can be used. And I would even go further. I was influenced by the late Jerry Cohen, who once presented a sympathetic reconstruction of Marx's theory of history. Is there a sympathetic reconstruction that we can make of the way in which Japanese moral and political thought relates to animals? And if we could do that, I think it would benefit different groups. It would benefit firstly Japanese, but also other people. Because you begin to see what these very careful and well-thought-out ways of thinking mean for animals. And that creates then the type of intercultural and interreligious dialogue that can actually challenge different groups to think about animals in more positive ways. Just very brief, your animal rebellion. I think we should make an effort to respond to all the questions. Uh, as has been identified, I'm more of an incremental change person than a direct action person. Nevertheless, it seems to me there, there is there is a place for both of these. Uh, in issues as important as this, I think people working within the system, trying to make things better stage by stage, are doing important work. I think also this, this more radical intervention that secures publicity and acts as a kind of vanguard, if you like, if one <laughs> makes the, the comparison with Leninism, uh, also has, has a role. So, yeah, I'm, it's not something I want to be part of, but I'm glad it's happening. <laughs> okay, let's take some more questions. I'll take these two. Um, so there's been uh, quite a bit of talk about uh, minorities versus majorities, and there seems to be some consensus that uh, majority practices matter a lot. <laughs> uh, so in terms of the, uh, in a global scale, the biggest uh, single markets with something approaching a common culture, single market markets for animal products, that is, uh, if they aren't already, then in the not too distant future, they will probably be China and India. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on the prospects for more ethical treatment of animals in those countries. Thanks. Just in front of you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question also with global perspectives. Just for, I wanted to bring up the case of quinoa. The rise of quinoa consumption in the West, uh, mainly by white citizens, wealthy citizens, trigger the spike of prices in the, product, the countries where the product was produced, where quinoa was produced, namely Peru and Bolivia, which deprived the farmers from the main crop for consumption, but made available to them access to meat, red meat that wasn't readily available before. So the Western drive for veganism literally created an impact in another part of the world where meat had to replace the newly found superfood of the West. Uh, so your thoughts about the global change of production, I know injustice is part of it, but it seems important to think in terms beyond the state, 
when we're considering these issues. Thank you. Thank you. And I think there was a question here. Yeah. There it was this one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and then next one. Um, thank you very much for your talk. I just had one note and one question. So my note was in relation to the debate you had about Islam. That I was thinking that there are as well now vegan Muslims that are reading the Quran in a different way. Uh, the work of Christine Steele at law school at Harvard is really interesting in that respect. And I was just wanted to point at that because you know there are different way, ways to read it and interpret it, and we shouldn't assume that because Islam. Therefore, just, that was a, a sort of a note. And then I wanted to ask you about the question of sovereignty in the way that Dines Vadivel, or Wadivel, I don't know how to pronounce it, in the war against animals, he discusses it. And what he says there is that we tend to think about ethics from a position of sovereignty. We are the sovereigns of the world, and therefore, um, when we think about ethics, he says, is what leads us to think in terms of welfare. It's a matter of managing kind of how things are, and being us humans, the ones that are at the top, the ones that rule, the ones that dominate and make decisions about who lives and who dies. So what he's trying to put forward in a way is the idea that we should kind of let go of that position. We should have an attitude, as it were, not to be that, that from Genesis with comes as well, uh, and so on. Now, my question is, uh, considering all this, um, I was thinking, and this is something I have not thought about, uh, how would this figure in relation to multiculturalism. Uh, it's something I've never thought about, but I thought, given we're discussing about this, if, because it, the way that he discusses this, as I understand, it's not taking into account different cultures. It's more a kind of ethical veganism point of view kind of thing. So what would you say about it? Thank you. Okay, so three very different questions there. One about China and India, one about quinoa, and then one about uh, sovereignty. Take your pick. Uh, I'll take quinoa. <laughs> um, or not, because anyway. Yeah. Um, so you're completely right. Um, the forces of globalization have made it very difficult to consume anything, right? Um, and I think that we do, there's nothing that you can say here. Right, that's going to resolve the complexity of global markets and the impact that your consumption habits have on other parts of the world. And it's not just for food, it's for everything. Everything that you consume, um, whether it be electronics or clothing or whatever, it's affecting people elsewhere in the world who are making those things. Uh, and then where the raw materials come from and all that, that stuff. So there's just a very general issue about ethical consumerism and veganism kind of fits in there. But you're right that depending on what you replace, um, non-human animal foods, uh, yeah, <laughs> non-human animals with, if you're eating them, then it might have these kinds of impacts. But there's no, I don't have an answer to that problem because we're just locked into these really vast and complex systems. But to say people should think about what they're consuming and where they're getting it from. I mean, there are people who are going to say, look, you should only buy local, right? And to some extent, you might be able to do that, but not always and not for everything. Um, so we're all in the same boat here. Regardless of what you eat, you're going to have these ethical obligations to think about what you're consuming um, because of the impacts it has in the rest of the world. But there's no easy answer, I don't think, to what you do. Um, I'm going to try to take on the last question. Um, and I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not sure how well I can address it. I mean, the notes, you're absolutely right, there are different ways of reading Islam. There's a rich literature on that. Um, but the idea that humans need to give up this idea of being superior to other animals. Now, I guess I feel torn. I don't have a good answer. On the one hand, as I've suggested, I, I was raised in a particular way that makes me very attracted to certain ways of thinking about human dignity that are not grounded in some sort of hierarchical human view. We have duties, responsibilities to animals. 
that might be a way in which I might ground human dignity, but not in a traditional Kantian way, for example. And I'm, I feel attracted to concepts like Ahizma. No harm on any living creature. I feel very attracted to that idea. But on the other hand, I can also envisage scenarios. And I'll ask you to envisage the following scenario. If a crop fails and villagers have two choices, they can eat their cattle or they can eat other human beings, I guess I would want them to eat cattle. And I, and I feel torn by that. I can see that my intuitions point in different directions. Take another example. Um, if I'm, walk- I'm just inventing these off the top of my head. Uh, if I'm walking in the park and I see a dog attack a small boy, I think I'm morally obliged to help that small boy. And... If that dog's hungry, I I don't think that's a justification for the attack, and I might even end up killing the dog. But I do think that if anyone says to me, oh, well, these two things are equal, I think my my intuitions again jar, because I I actually feel some sort of greater obligation to the human being. Now... (coughs) I know that's not necessarily going to convince the ethical vegan. I know that as well. But I also know that this is a part of the way in which I think about morality that's quite common, isn't always wrong, as far as I can see, and I'm not sure how to reconcile it. I'm hoping Angie at this point will show me how to reconcile it. Well, I mean, one thing... Can I... Is that right? Um, so one thing that you might say is that, so you cash that out, so you've got a tragic choice, right? You can only save one, and you've got a choice between a human and a dog, right? And you say that you feel that you've got an obligation to save the human. You might just think, look, you're permitted to show partiality in that case. But to be honest, if it was you or my dog... You know, I might save my dog, and I don't think I did anything wrong, right? Well, but the type of partiality that's being introduced there is one of a relationship yeah. with the particular animal, which is very different to the scenario that I painted. And in the scenario I painted, what's doing the work is that you don't know the boy, and you don't know the animal. But you can feel kinship, right? And that's the kind of relationship that you might be able to... I'm only talking about tragic choice situations here, right? And they're not the kinds of situations that we face in our day-to-day lives. So and we should know. also make clear that you can't extrapolate from that. You should mystery animals, right? We're just talking about, I guess, moral equality. Yeah. Right? That's what we're really talking yeah. about, right? So it might be permissible to show partiality to your kin. Just, you know your family, your friends, why not your species? Maybe. Tragic choice. Flip a coin. Choose on the basis of kinship. How would you justify that partiality? You just like humans more. I just uh, like women more. That's, I mean, not, that's not a justification, well, though. Is I it? mean, but it's a tragic choice, right? So, whatever you do, someone's going to die. What kind of reasons can you invoke to make that decision? And it seems to me that... I think just saying that I them. like humans. Well, I like my dog. I think I might I, like dogs in general more I, than humans. So you're I, saying, actually, there's no possible philosophical <coughs> justification for choosing one over the other. And you're saying that's not good enough. I'm saying that we usually seek philosophical justifications in our work, and we shouldn't eschew doing so now. So, would you want to uh, adjudicate here? Uh, oh, God, but that assumes we're fighting. I don't think we are. Eh? Shall, I think we're quite just, close to one another. Let's respond quickly to the outstanding questions. We have come some more contributions from the floor. Uh, <coughs> prospects for the ethical treatment of animals in uh, China and India. Uh, yes, m- meat eating levels, especially in China, are increasing very rapidly at the moment as China. Uh, industrialises and develops economically and people become more prosperous. It will be interesting to see the extent to which this 
this continues, or will Western uh, the, 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 the Western move away from meat and animal use that we're seeing has been intimated in some of the discussions this evening kick, sort of kick in there quite soon in parallel with developments in the West or will there be a long time lag with that? Uh, India may be similarly and in both countries this is interesting to me with regards to multiculturalism because there are religious traditions in, in both those countries that, that mitigate against meat consumption and animal use. So, so in, in these uh, parts, there seems to me to be an issue about actually how secularism can be a threat to animal welfare rather than uh, a promoter of animal welfare. I'll just come back and say that these different countries also have their own conceptions of secularism. And you're thinking about secularism in a particular way in the West. In India, for example, secularism is about respecting all cultural and religious traditions, very different to the American wall between church and state, very different to the two-way relationship that exists in France between religion and the state. And if you respect <coughs> all religions and cultures, actually you make it a little bit easier for some of the traditions that you spoke of to show their face and to become more important. That said, and this is an important rider about India, vegetarianism has often been restricted amongst particular castes. It's often been something that Brahmins have and lower castes don't. And there's another level of injustice that we have to think about when we think about India, China and places like that because whilst they have those, those traditions, sometimes those traditions are not very widespread and they're indicative of other hierarchies that are morally problematic. I feel like we could talk about this yeah. for a long time but I do want to get in another round of questions so we'll pick up on that question I missed before. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the insightful discussion. Definitely back everything Dr. Andrew has been saying. Um, so my question would be, why do people struggle to see the parallels between speciesism, racism, and sexism, etc., and as being structural discrimination? Also, um, is it because perhaps that the dominant group are not willing to let go of their position in that structural hierarchy in which they are the ones who benefit from that system of advantage. Thank you. Thank you. Could you pass the mic along? Uh, thank you for the discussion. Um, I'd like to direct my question to David, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, I thought you raised some really interesting points. Um, one of the things you mentioned were crop, crop related deaths, small rodents signing crops. Uh, the thing is, the animals we, we eat um, in the West are predominantly fed with crops like grain and soy. So there's more crop related deaths because we eat animals. So we'd actually reduce the amount of small rodents dying if you went vegan. Um, and I think what you're really making there is an, an appeal to futility fallacy, which is to suggest that because we can't end all animal suffering, we might as well kill animals to eat by the billions. Um, you also mentioned RSPCA approval. Um, the thing is, the RSPCA, RSPCA actually approve uh, male chicks being ground up alive in the British egg industry. So it doesn't really mean anything. It's more just a way to make us feel better about buying the product. Um, but my question actually comes from the idea of stunning an animal before we kill them, um, or giving them a good life first. And the thing is, I'm sure nobody on a panel would accept this logic in a human context. If I only killed really happy humans that I found here, you wouldn't accept it. If I stunned the, the humans before I killed them, we wouldn't accept it. So what's implicit in what you're saying is that there's a difference between humans and non-human animals that justifies that difference in treatment. So my question is, what is the trait difference between, say, myself and a cow that justifies killing the cow, but not me. Thank you. And there's a couple of very persistent hands at the back, so if you could pass it back. Hi. Really um, so I was just wondering if you think that moral agency has any role in determining um, human versus non-human animal rights, whether that, because they don't have moral agency, they're less deserving of rights. Thank you. And just a last question there. 
Uh, I have encountered many um, times when um, I recommend Chinese food to my friends who are not from China. But all the time, many times they will ask me, oh, um, have you ever eaten dogs? Um, at this time, I felt like very <laughs> strange. Like, it, 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 this, situ this situation has ha happened so many times for me. So I'm feeling like it's kind of a uh, stereotype for many people to say Chinese people eat dogs. However, um, what's the difference between dogs and uh, chip, uh, uh, and sheep and chickens or cones? Like, what's the ethic logic behind eating them? Like, why? It seems like eating dogs is not civilized, but eating chickens are very, very normal. But why? Why is that like? Why, why is that? Why, why is that? So I'm always confused. Thank you. I, I have met so many people asking me this. So yeah, I really want to know the reason. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, four very different questions, so we've got about four minutes to cover them. <coughs> well, shall I start with a question directed to me? Uh, what, what's the, what's the, the moral difference between humans and non-humans that justifies us eating uh, non-humans uh, but not humans? Well, the, 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 dif the difference is that where we are is a situation where in society there is a wide moral consensus that eating animals is acceptable whereas eating humans isn't. I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> that would be an appeal to popularity fallacy. So just the fact that people agree. I'm sorry, we don't have time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, dogs, cows, chickens... Um, you shouldn't eat any of them. Uh, people who, who make that accusation, which is an accusation, oh, why do you do that? They're just inconsistent, right? They just, they're valuing one thing and not another, and the two things are the same, right? So they're just being inconsistent. So um, really quickly again. Yep. Um, just on the speciesism, racism, sexism, why, don't, why do people struggle to see the connections between these things? Um, I mean, I often wonder whether really what's at work there is where, where we've been able to kind of overcome the othering of other humans. It's just hard for some humans to overcome thinking about other animals on the same plane because they're very different, right? They look different, they do different things. Some of them are more like us than others. But I wonder whether that's... I mean, I don't, I don't get it, but like that, I think, has to be doing some of the work, right? They're just not like us in some relevant sense for those people right um and so you just kind of have to be continually locked into a battle of showing how they're like us in the morally relevant way and that's all that matters um do you eat dogs um at one level i think andy's <laughs> right they're just being inconsistent at another level i would remove the just and say that something else is going on here there's an appeal to stereotypes and these people think that they have license to use stereotypes to put, put a question to you. Um, I find that <coughs> common and troubling. Um, with regards to the parallels between speciesism and racism, I think it boils down to the question about equality and are humans and animals, are non-human animals and human animals morally equal? And as I've said, I, I have conflicting intuitions on that. Um, and the great thing about some, a situation like this is uh, it brings out my conflicting intuitions and forces us all to think, to think a lot harder about these issues. One more? Yeah. Just on moral agency. Yeah. Um, so moral agency... <laughs> Uh, there's lots of things we can say about why it shouldn't be the thing that gets you rights. Um, so moral agency is normatively significant, right? It makes a difference to the kind of pers to the kind of being that you are. If you're a moral agent, then you're going to have certain responsibilities, right? Because you can do certain things, make choices about how you act, and abide by moral norms. Um, but that doesn't say anything about which beings are entitled to protection. Okay, so. Moral agents, yes, they have certain responsibilities and certain powers, but it doesn't follow that they're the only beings that have rights. 
Thank you. We are out of time, unfortunately. Uh, do join us again next Wednesday when we're talking about philosophy as therapy. Thank you so much for coming. Join me in thanking our speakers.